Hi, I'm Dr. Lynn Calabrese from the R.J. Faisenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology, and it's really my great pleasure to give to you Chapter 1, Basic and Clinical Immunology, our seven-part course on the integrated immune response. As a result of participating in this module, you should be able to define the purpose of generating an integrated immune response. You should be also be able to define innate immunity and adaptive immunity and differentiate them from each other. You can describe the receptors for the components of innate immunity and their mechanisms of action. And finally, a very current concept, you should be able to describe the role of neutrophilic nets in health and disease. Throughout this series, we will be using two textbooks from Garland Science, The Immune System by Peter Parham and Janeway's Immunobiology. Consider this course a framework for learning, and these textbooks will supply deep background for those who want more. So let's start with some basic questions. Here we have a man who's thinking. He's thinking about why do we have an immune system? I mean, what is its purpose? If we think about the circulatory system or the neurologic system, there are some plain answers, I think. But the immune system, think about it. If you go back in time, a little bit of medical history would tell us that even at the end of the 1700s, when Jenner performed his pivotal experiment to demonstrate that vaccines, to vaccinate, could protect against an infection, there was no idea that we had an underlying immune system. Nearly 100 years later, the great Pasteur furthered this work scientifically, still had no idea about an immune system. He thought that the organisms were merely depleting nutrients. It was not until about 1890 when Emil von Behring, who was awarded the first Nobel Prize in medicine, developed serotherapy. But even here, the details were rather scanty. It was the great Ehrlich, a few years later, who codified antibodies, describing them, and the cells that they came from. I consider this really the birth of modern immunology. So what triggers an immune response? Here's our man thinking again, and he's kind of sitting in a sea of pathogens. It was not too long ago that we thought that the purpose of the immune system was merely to respond to infections. About 60 years ago, uh, Sir Frank McFarland Burnett and Peter Medawar refined this hypothesis and suggested that within the thymus, we positively and negatively selected cells based upon foreignness. So is foreignness the answer? Is that why we generate an immune response? I actually don't think so because right before I gave this talk, I had a nice cup of coffee with cream and that's pretty foreign to my body. But I'm feeling pretty good right now. So there has to be a bit more to the answer. Over the past decade, a new theory has come forth. And this is called the immunologic danger hypothesis. Uh, Dr. Polly Matzinger is one of the prime architects of this, and it has been refined significantly since the original. We have danger signals that can be from outside the body, certainly like infections. But we, they can recognize the difference between outside infections and bowel pathogens or pathogens found in our uh, oral flora. There are also internal danger signals that we have to deal with. And this comes from dying cells or foreign material that is not always foreign, such as urate crystals. We'll get into this a little bit more detail in a few minutes. So let's start with an example. This looks like a nice sunny day to me. I don't really see much in the way of danger, so I think I'll take a walk. So I'm walking down this road. There's a nice fence. It's old. It's beautiful, but there's a rusty nail. And on my hand, I've now punctured it. That's not good. So our immune system has to decide what to do and how and when. So this is a lecture on the organization of the immune response, and this is the way I see the integrated immune response. There are three layers. We have anatomic and physiologic barriers. We have the innate immune response that we'll talk about in great detail. And finally, adaptive immunity. Anatomic and physiologic barriers seem to make a lot of sense. We have to keep the foreign danger signals out. 
innate immune system, first line of defense after that, followed by adaptive immunity. That's what we usually think of when we talk about the immune response, T cells and B cells. That really comes somewhat later. Here are two figures. We have this prokaryotic cell, very primitive, doesn't even have a nuclear membrane. And down below, we have the phylogenetic tree. If you look up in the corner there, you see vertebrates, us, mammals. We're really the only part of this phylogenetic tree that has an adaptive immune response. Yet everything else in the phylogenetic tree has a robust defense mechanism largely accounted for by innate immunity. So let's define this. I like to say innate immunity are those elements of the immune system that respond rapidly to harmful or dangerous stimuli by recognizing nonspecific and shared patterns occurring both externally and internally to the host. I know that's a little pedagogic, so let's break this down a little bit. The innate immune response defends us without memory. We think of immunizing, generating T cell memory and B cell memory. The innate immune system does not have that. It is rapid and early, and it should be, because after an inoculum of bacteria, such as on my punctured hand, you can generate over a trillion bacteria with, even within one day. So we need to be able to respond to that uh, very, very rapidly. Another concept that is now well accepted is that the uh, proteins that participate in innate immunity are expressed by the germline, not subjected to mutation or rearrangement. And then lastly, we have to recognize that the immune system that is innate responds to general patterns, not to the entire universe of foreignness like the adaptive immune response. So let's first say a few words about barriers. This seems kind of straightforward. We have skin, gut, lungs. We have some other uh, areas that are shown on this slide. And it's just a mechanical barrier, or is it more than that? It is significantly more than that. We have chemicals at these surfaces, including fatty acids, changes in pH, et cetera, that defend us. But we also have specific uh, weapons in our innate immune response that I'll show you in a minute that are designed to kill uh, foreign microbes. We also have friendly bacteria on all our mucosal surfaces that are part of this innate initial line of defense. This is a remarkable protein. This is one of the beta defensins. We classify this as an antimicrobial peptide. We have many of them. You know, when I was starting my immunology training, we thought the skin was just skin. It was a barrier. Uh, it was effective. It kept things out. Now we know that it is alive with uh, molecules of the innate immune system. These beta defensins can penetrate the lipid bilayers, leading to disruption of microbes. This is just one tiny example of how the integument protects us from danger. There are also soluble weapons. Here I'm showing you a few. On the top is mannose binding lectin. Uh, this is uh, very similar to C1Q. It's capable of activating complement, and we recognize the carbohydrates specific for certain types of microbes. Down below, this five-structured pentraxin. Here we see CRP, and we know that CRP, part of the acute phase, is also capable of opsonizing and fixing complement. So there are soluble components to the innate immune system. Here we're getting into more of the cellular elements. And we see the dendritic cell, macrophage, neutrophiles, and other cells. These all share certain functional characteristics. Uh, and I will show you in a minute, they are capable of recognizing foreignness and bringing back intelligence to the central immune system to prime the adaptive response. Here's a macrophage, and this figure uh, from uh, Parham shows many different types of receptors on the surface, all capable of detecting foreign danger signals. Some are keyed to certain carbohydrate patterns, others to v other varying foreign patterns, but they are literally festooning the exterior of this cell. 
once a bacterium or a virus or protozoan is recognized, it can be internalized into a phagosome and then fused with a lysosome uh, to form a phagolysosome uh, to further degrade this either for antigen presentation or just merely to kill it. We keep referring to patterns. The innate immune system does not respond to just a change of a single amino acid. It knows broad patterns that are foreign and dangerous. Here are two examples. Uh, gram-positive organisms with tichioic acid, gram-negative organisms with lipopolysaccharide. And then below, we see lysozyme, a, a defensive chemical that's in tears and saliva, which can uh, recognize key motifs within carbohydrates, leading to degradation and ultimately killing uh, foreign invaders. So it's a pretty remarkable system. So now at 30,000 feet, we see these danger signals. Microbes, I think we can understand those pretty well by these patterns. But what about nucleic acids? Things like double-stranded RNA, that doesn't occur in uh, the uh, human uh, biology. Um, CPG DNA, hypomethylated DNA, more characteristic of microbes than mammals. And finally, viral and, and microbial RNA. Those are external. We can kind of understand them in the context of the integrated immune response. But down below, there are endogenous danger signals. I think the easiest one for us to understand, particularly if you're a rheumatologist, is uric acid. Those crystals don't naturally occur, but they are made of endogenous uric acid, and they can cause a pretty nasty triggering of the auto-inflammatory response. There are also other uh, endogenous danger signals, including things like hyaluronin and HMGB1 uh, um, and many others. Uh, but we're not going to get into these in details. But I would refer you back to our textbooks uh, for a, a lot more detail on these areas. So who's this little guy? This is a fruit fly, and he is highly disturbed. Uh, some of his ventral parts are dorsal, and some of his dorsal parts are ventral. This was an experiment performed nearly 20 years ago by mutating a single gene. And the German scientist who looked at this little insect said, toll, kind of means far out or weird, or strange. Well, everyone knows about toll receptors, and they are now probably one of the most exciting advances in understanding how the immune system works um, that we have been studying for the past two decades. There are about 10 members of the mammalian toll uh, surface and uh, intracellular uh, network of receptors. They all have shared um, structural motifs, as I'm showing you here. And just think about them as general membrane receptors to recognize foreign danger signals. Some of them will recognize lipopolysaccharide. Other will recognize uh, tichioic acid motifs. Some will recognize the antigens of flagellin. Some will recognize viral uh, RNA or DNA. So they are generated to recognize those general danger patterns uh, that can pose a risk to the host. So what do these toll receptors do? Well, there's a lot of complicated biochemistry, and I promised you I would spare you that. But think of them as performing one of two main functions. One, they can activate the NF-kappa B pathway, which is synonymous with inflammation, leading to a cascade of inflammatory mediators. The other is the interferon pathway, and as you know, this is important in antiviral immunity and other host defenses. I don't want you to think that we just have toll receptors as pattern recognition molecules. We have many others. There are the nodes and the rigs, which recognize other bacterial and viral antigens. We have soluble molecules, which I've already kind of talked about, pentraxins, collectins, and phycolins, which can opsonize and activate complement. And we also have phagocytically expressed molecules like the C-type lectins and scavenger receptors that can recognize these general patterns. Here we have a macrophage. It is covered by these pattern recognition receptors. Once triggered, here we can see a number of different biologic activities that can result from this. We have inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1 and TNF, which do all the things that inflammation does. Fever, changing endothelial surfaces, leukocyte trafficking, IL-6, 
the prime generator of the acute phase reaction. But also, it can affect chemokine expression, which affects the trafficking of cells, and things like IL-12, which can trigger in the adaptive immune response, a Th1 response. We'll, see, uh, we'll hear a lot more about this as we go along. This is a classical paper by my friend Irving Kushner, and this shows the acute phase reaction after acute inflammation. Here we have CRP climbing dramatically. Remember, the acute phase reaction is a generation of the innate immune response. We use this clinically, but these molecules are all involved in host defense. Now let's turn to something that is very, very current. And if you've been out of medical school for more than a couple of years, this may be a foreign concept. What do we have? I'm asking you, what is a net? In this elegant but brief review by Bosch in the New England Journal, he describes the function of nets in health and disease. On the right of the slide, we see polymorphonuclear leukocytes. These are short-lived cells. They die generally by apoptosis, but in recent years, they can die by another pathway called netosis. Here we see the release of the net, which is DNA, which can then entrap microbes participating in our host defense, but also can carry danger signals. In the upper left is a dendritic cell responding to those danger signals, secreting interferon. And this is what appears to be happening in the pathogenesis of SLE. We also know that in conditions like ANCA-associated vasculitis, these nets can entrap molecules such as myeloperoxidase and can be found within the renal lesions. So you will hear much more about netosis. If you're interested at all, read this short uh, but elegant article by Bosch. So what is the function of innate immunity? Think of it as three things. Limits the extent of initial microbial infections. It can then prime the adaptive immune system if we need it. And finally, while we haven't talked too much about this, it is involved in wound repair and tissue remodeling. So let's go back to my hand. So our lines of defense are three. In the first few hours, we depend upon the integument, our antimicrobial peptides. If I haven't reined this in, which it doesn't look like you're doing a very good job of, we need the innate immune response. We have all of those cells uh, within these peripheral tissues that can gather information and try to end the attack where it is occurring. Failing that in a few days, we need to bring in more advanced armament, and that is the adaptive immune response. And you'll hear about that in the subsequent chapters, and you'll see how this occurs. So finally, think about this. We have on the left, our innate immune response, rapid, fixed, limited in the number of uh, foreign uh, type of characteristics it can see, um, but it occurs in a very few hours to a few days and can end the initial attack. On the right, we see the adaptive immune response. It is slower, days to weeks, highly variable, can recognize just minute differences in antigens, uh, and it evolves over time. It's characteristics of us being mammals and vertebrates, and the two are really not separate. And as we will go along in this course, you'll see there's more similarities and differences. So you've invested a few minutes of your time. This is the overview of the integrated immune response. There are six more chapters. If you like what you're seeing, I urge you to follow along in the textbooks and come back for chapter two on T-cell ontogeny and positive and negative selection by my good friend, William Rigby. Thanks, I'm Dr. Len Calabrese, welcoming you to basic and clinical immunobiology.